Welcome all to another episode of the Most Notorious Podcast. I'm Eric Rivenis. As usual, let's skip the small talk and jump right into today's interview. It is so nice to have Denise White Parkinson with me. She is an Arkansas native with a long career in journalism, including writing for the Arkansas Democrat, the Arkansas Democrat Gazette, the Arkansas Times, Mature Arkansas, and the Little Rock Free Press. Since 2008, she's been the lead writer for Hot Springs Life and Home magazine. And her book, which she is here to discuss today, is called Daughter of the White River, Depression-Era Treachery and Vengeance in the Arkansas Delta. Thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you for having me, Eric, and what a wonderful way to start the week. Yes, yes, exactly. So this is a really personal story for you, isn't it? Absolutely. I did not know who Helen Spence was until I started researching my own family history because my family were river people and both of our houseboats had been destroyed in true bipartisan fashion (laughs) by various administrations Democrat, Republican, and I started researching it and met the most wonderful people that became like family, and Helen Spence is their muse, and she became my muse, because river people are, by and large, artisans and artists. So, river people, uh, before we get into the details of the story I'd love it if you could paint a picture for us. Uh, Describe for us the White River, where it is, the importance of the river to the people who live there, especially in the 1920s and 30s. Yes, the White River, which because my maiden name is White, I just assumed it was our river (laughs) when I was a little child. And it is the longest river in Arkansas. It starts in the Northwest. It very strangely pokes up into Missouri and then it comes back down into Arkansas and crisscrosses the state and eventually joins up in the southeast corner of the state in the Delta with the Arkansas River and the Mississippi River at a place with a beautiful name called River's End. And river people were houseboat culture. They were multi-ethnic, multiracial, several branches of these network of houseboat communities kept their original languages, but because they identified with nature and the river, they were a successful multi-ethnic community. That's the short version. The long version is they had a sustainable culture, river culture included the sustainable harvesting of white river mussel shells. So this is a 700 mile long river and the mussel shells were so plentiful in the White River and other rivers as well. There were button factories, which were often just very simple makeshift open air places where people sat and punched button forms out of hand gathered mussel shells. And then they they saved the mussel meat for hog feed. So they had some pretty healthy hogs. (laughs) (laughs) So these beautiful mother of pearl buttons were so plentiful and such a sustainable industry for my ancestors that they had contracts from Arkansas to supply the entire United States Army uniforms with buttons. And this only went away after the rise of post-war cheap plastic. So... We sacrificed our sustainable industry for plastic, and maybe it's time to go back to the future. (laughs) (laughs) So this time period, a lot of events happen in the very late 1920s up to the mid-30s in in the United States. Uh, Of course, it's a time for transition, Uh, prohibition, winding down, the, the stock market crash, the depression. Yes, it seemed to me that it's, incredibly relevant to the situation of, of what's happening today. 
I've interviewed so many old timers in Arkansas throughout my career. And one statement that I heard multiple times was there's always a depression in Arkansas. So the, the model of income inequality and plantation mentality just really began in Arkansas and it strengthened during the great depression because of all the land grabs. And there's a passage in my book, that refers to a quote from the Associated Press in 1932 that a government committee had found that it was a dangerous situation that the, let me read exactly what it says, an alarming tendency toward monopolistic control of the food of the nation by a small group of powerful corporations. That was printed on the, in the Gazette, March 2nd, 1931. And here we are with Kroger about to merge with Al, or take over Albertsons and become just a mega corporation. So the issues then and the issues today are so similar. And it really explains the kind of desperado motif that you had of outlaws all over the newspaper back then. Nowadays, outlaws are the stars of a Netflix series. Helen Spence was not an outlaw. She was more of a Greek tragedy type figure. And that explains why so many years after her death, she's still revered as though she just died yesterday. And people still make pilgrimages to her grave in Arkansas County. So Helen Spence, of course, is the central figure in your book. She lived a short but pretty remarkable life. What do we know about her early years? When did her family settle in the area? What did her father do for a living? She was very much a quintessential river girl in that her family was situated where actually where my family's houseboat was for generations at Clarendon, which is basically the gateway of the Delta. And it's a beautiful town and it's the centerpiece of a lot of our documentary film because there was a bridge there and the government just blew it up (laughs) while we were making our film. So once again, river people, were, were stolen. And the interesting part about the Clarendon Bridge is not only was it built by river people, it was built in 1931 when Helen Spence was still alive. And it was built at what we think was her birthplace. There's no birth certificate because she was born on a houseboat. But a 19, I believe it was a 1920 census places her as a young child in Clarendon. So she would have known that area. And then at some point, her father, Cicero, and she also had a sister who had childhood polio, but was still on the houseboat being cared for, as well as her stepmother, Ada, Helen's biological mother, was a beautiful woman with uh, very blonde hair, which is unusual on the river. Her name was Ellen Woods, and she passed away when Helen was a toddler. So her nuclear family consisted of her father, her developmentally disabled sister, and her stepmother. They moved with the houseboat, floated downstream, I guess about 30 miles to uh, St. Charles. And that's where she grew up, which is a more remote location. And they were timber uh, scouts. They would float timber out of the woods They would be hunting guides. They were subsistence farmers on the adjacent land to where they preferred living on houseboats on the water. But they would have plots of land where they would have farms and livestock. All of this changed after Helen, you know, tragic trajectory when the government took over 600,000 plus acres of bottomland, of the lower White River, which constituted 
the river people's entire community. So from Clarendon all the way down to St. Charles, countless families were driven off the river and their houseboats were burned and sank as recently as the 1990s. So this story is, is just a lost history. And the most tragic part of it is that while I was been researching Helen Spence for all these years, it becomes clearer and clearer to me that she was the real life prototype, the inspiration for the character of Maddie Ross in True Grit. And I have reconstructed Charles Portis's timeline and how he came upon this story. And I am convinced they both avenged their father's death. But the fictional character was treated very differently than the real life Arkansas folk hero because the real life Arkansas folk hero was considered a river rat, which is a phrase still in use in the 21st century, if you can believe it. The term river rat, it's considered derogatory. It is definitely derogatory when used by outsiders. I considered myself the luckiest girl in the world because I felt like a a, a fairy princess. Uh, We spent summers on my great-grandfather's houseboat at Clarendon Levee until it was destroyed. Uh, So those were the happiest times of my life. My father is named Matt. (laughs) So poor thing, he had to grow up hearing the chants of Matt, Matt, the river rat the whole time he was in school. And uh, that was not very nice, but river people, they use both terms interchangeably amongst themselves. So river family, river people, river rats. And actually I've even heard river mafia, but it's all a very playful approach However, it's still derogatory. There are still people in Arkansas government positions that have said as recently as seven years ago that Helen Spence was basically a whore. And I reject that because I've done the research. So let's talk about the catalyst that begins this journey for Helen Spence uh, down this violent and tragic path the murder of her father and stepmother. Yes, that was the beginning of the strange history. And it was in 1930. Now, Helen Spence being a daughter and and Cicero had no sons and the other daughter was uh, unable to, to walk. Cicero concentrated on teaching Helen all of the skills he knew. So she could, she could hunt, she could shoot a gun, as well as any sharpshooter. And then she could also, as a river girl, you know, sew and tat lace and make all of her own clothing and knit and crochet, just like my river grannies could. And uh, so she was very beautiful and stylish, but she was also very feisty and could gut a deer and, and clean a fish and shoot a man if she had to. So what happened was that her father was in a boat with a man named Jack Worrells, who was from uh, Rosedale, Mississippi. And there seemed to be some strange back and forth between Rosedale and uh, the lower White River. We're still not sure if there were timber company mercenaries hired from the Rosedale area to basically try to run out the river people so they could have access to all the timber which is interesting that later on, that's exactly what the federal government did with the establishment of the many federal wildlife refuges that ran the river people off. But at any rate, Helen's father, Cicero, being a fisher guy, a fisherman's guide and a hunting guide, was with Jack Worrells on the boat. And from that standpoint, at that time period of the river people, It was a hunting trip that turned into a robbery that turned into a terrible murder that was, I'm convinced from my research, witnessed by Helen and her 
stepmother who were coming and approaching in a, in an additional boat. And so Jack Worrell's shot Cicero threw him over the side of the boat and then motioned for Helen and Ada to not leave. He put the gun on them and Ada convinced him that Helen was a simple minded girl and did not know where any of the money was. She sacrificed herself and went with Jack Worrell's and he raped and beat her and she died of her injuries. So it just caused an uproar up and down the river all the way to Memphis because uh, Ada ended up dying in the Memphis hospital. Oh, so what happened next? Uh, there, there was a trial for Jack Worrells, right? Yes. Um, it was, everyone knew he did it and he was arrested and brought to trial in DeWitt, which is one of the county seats of Arkansas County. It's got two county seats because of all the rivers. So this was DeWitt, and she was uh, staying with the, a local sheriff and his wife, waiting for the trial, because she was basically an orphan, and her sister had been fetched off to Oklahoma by some distant relatives. So she was all alone and she couldn't go back to the river because she was staying, I guess, in protective type custody because Jack Rolls had basically killed off her family. And that's when the trial took place in January of 1931. And do you want me to describe the trial? I I would love it. Yeah. It was quite the celebration, wasn't it? Yes. People came from miles around and filled up. There's a huge town square in DeWitt. So it was filled with all the buckboards and model tees. And my uh, way to access the story and how I related in the book was exactly how it was told to me by a witness. And his story is in the book. And He was my great friend that I discovered when I was looking for river information. And he had actually moved to Hot Springs from Arkansas County. So we became great friends because I was living in Hot Springs as well. And his name is Elsie Brown. And he was about five years old when the trial took place. And he adored Helen. All the children on the river loved her. She was a great playmate. And Mr. Brown's father was the deputy sheriff of Arkansas County. L.C. Brown was Lemuel Cressy Brown Jr. So that's a heck of an Arkansas name. So everyone called his dad Sheriff Lim. And he was inside the courtroom uh, during the trial of Jack Worrells and said that Helen sat there for hours in a beautiful red silk and wool uh, suit that she had sewn herself with a beautiful white rabbit fur muff and just sat there like a beautiful statue for hours during the trial. L.C., being a child, was out on the court square playing kickball with all the other kids, and all of a sudden they hear shots ringing out from the courtroom And then all the windows on the ground floor flew up and people started pouring out of the courthouse windows and rolling onto the ground to get away. And they could hear the sounds of furniture crashing and screams and all the kids were in an uproar. And when Mr. Brown's father, Sheriff Lim, finally came out, he told them that Helen had just pulled out a pearl-handled lady's pistol from the fur muff she wore and shot Jack Worrells four times in the chest in such a tight pattern you could put a hat over it. And then she turned around and Sheriff Lim was approaching and she handed him the gun and they took her off to a side room and Sheriff Lim was trying to open the gun and get the remaining bullets out of the chamber and his hands were shaking. And so Helen snatched the gun out of his hand and said, it tends to stick. Let me help you. And she 
opened it up. And but while she was doing that, every man in the room ducked under the furniture and just dove under the nearest table. So it just was pandemonium. And uh, that's when Helen Spence became front page news all over the country because there were Associated Press reporters in Arkansas because Arkansas had recently had the very first food riot of the Great Depression. So the Delta was a hot spot. So was it common for people in Arkansas to carry guns into courtrooms during this this era? And if not, how do you think she managed to sneak it in? I I think it was just because she was so incredibly stylish that nobody would dream that part of her accessorizing would include a pearl-handled lady's pistol because she, Helen did not have a gun and there was speculation that it was the sheriff's wife uh, that she had been staying with the, a local sheriff and his wife in DeWitt and that the wife was so sympathetic to Helen's plight that she gave her that gun. But I couldn't put that in my book because that was just too much gossip. But it lines up with the way people felt. They either thought Helen was just a total outlaw like Bonnie Parker or they listened to what Helen said in the courtroom, the only explanation she gave was he killed my daddy. So she had grown up knowing something called river justice, which is an eye for an eye, but it's all about loyalty and family and protecting your family. So for example, some of the river people we spoke with, they would tell stories about how if there was a, a bad river person and he was stealing fish out of the nets of a different river person, there were a couple of situations. One of them I thought was very karmic was that uh, the thief was wrapped up in a fishing net and thrown into the river to teach him a lesson. Now, because he was a river man, he had a knife on him and he cut himself out of the net so it didn't kill him, but it cured him from stealing. (laughs) So when somebody committed something as egregious as what Jack Worlds had done, river justice was the only answer to it from the standpoint of river culture. Helen's mistake was that she was so young, she didn't know, she didn't care She was doing what she had been raised to believe was what you did, but she took river justice off the river and brought it into Drylander Hall of Justice, which was the courthouse. And Drylander Justice is not river justice. So was there some moment in this trial that disturbed her? Why did she pull the trigger in that particular moment? Well, according to my research, they had not recovered Cicero's body when the trial took place. Uh, his He was in the river until spring when his body resurfaced. So he was still technically, his body was not as evidence. So there was some question as to whether Jack Worlds would get away with it and be found not guilty on some technicality. There was chatter about that happening. And I think Helen Spence was just there to make sure that some form of justice was carried out because river people, by and large, did not have any faith in drylander justice. In fact, Mr. Brown's father, uh, Sheriff Lim, was the only deputy that was allowed to come down onto the river. And, you know, he would meet with Cicero. And if somebody had a a summons to court, he would put the word out through Cicero and Cicero would make sure the person showed up. But it was because Sheriff Lim, his brother, or it was either his brother or his uncle, Archie, had a houseboat and lived on a houseboat. So they were basically a bridge family 
They were a bridge between river culture and farming because some of their people were river people and others were farmers. Interesting, yeah. She's a a very young woman when she witnesses her father's murder, and then her stepmother sacrifices herself. I mean, Helen had to have been suffering from some trauma. Absolutely. And there were some accounts that she was out of her mind with grief. There was, I remember, it was hard to know how to steer between. I tried to find as many stories that lined up with their details because, as you well know, back then there were no bylines. And so there was very little accountability. And a lot of what was printed about Helen Spence just was to fill space and become very, became over the years, very exploitative, what I would call yellow journalism. But there were, there were several stories that were very, you know, I thought were accurate. There was one that I could never track down that said she even attempted suicide because of the madness of her grief was so overwhelming because she lost her sister as well. And they were very close. So there's no telling how much grief and PTSD played into it. I will say that my great uncle was a river man. His name was Brent Granberry. And uh, he came back from World War II with PTSD, which back then they call shell shock. And he ended up getting sent to the VA, the Veterans Administration Hospital, where they electrocuted him during shock treatment. And he was only in his 20s. So there there were so much losses to river people that the culture itself, it's, it's what I call an indigenous culture. We're not indigenous, but we do have multiracial and indigenous ancestors. So with indigenous culture, you see the shock wave that goes through so many generations. And then As time passes, the the grandchildren and the descendants try to pick up the thread of the history and try to release that generational trauma because it is trauma to be constantly robbed of your homes and exiled and for well over 100 years still called rats. So Helen is arrested then, correct? She was allowed to live with the sheriff and his wife again and uh, work at a local cafe in DeWitt because her case was proceeding through various, you know, grand jury, this and that. There was a there was a lot of uh, articles written about potential pardon from the governor. There was a, a big election year approaching. So she was just kind of in this legal limbo, but she was released to be able to work and live under, you know, somewhat supervision. And she was doing so well working in this little cafe that the judge of the uh, Arkansas County gave her permission to move into an apartment with one of my readers that is in the in the film. We interview him in the film. His great aunt was roommates with Helen Spence, and they both worked at this restaurant. And that's when another interesting kind of backstory or subplot, I guess, a twist in the film and the book. It's one of the reasons I had to make the film, because in the book, you will get to the part where she's waiting to find out if she will get a pardon or if she will be sent to prison. And she's working in the restaurant. And the manager of the restaurant was just a a terrible, terrible person. He was what the river people called a no good. They didn't call people trash, but if somebody was an evil person, they would just call them a no good. So this man was very (laughs) hands-on as a restaurant manager, and he tried to get fresh with Helen Spence on multiple occasions and but he was he was like an equal opportunity offender so when he turned up dead one day helen was the prime suspect but after interviewing and and investigating the case went cold now this case 
later in the story will come back to haunt, but she was released from suspicion. And when Helen was finally granted her legal decision about her future, it boiled down to a couple of years for manslaughter at the Arkansas Women's Prison, which was also known as the Pea Farm. Yeah, this this guy's name was Jim Bohatz, right? And he was Greek. They called him the Greek, which was, uh, I guess they used that as a pejorative. I don't know. But uh, my favorite comedian is Greek. I, I, I didn't know anything about the history of, of uh, Greek folks in Arkansas, but he was not a nice man. And he was very sexist and he was very aggressive and he had a lot of people that hated him. And so the consensus was after the case went cold, another saying from Arkansas County was, well, he needed killing. And I saw the place where they found his body and Mr. Brown remembers the car he used to have because it was like the biggest, the flashiest car of the 1930s with huge running boards on either side. So anybody could have killed this man, but that's another difference between drylander culture and river culture. Almost to a person, uh, river people will defend Helen and say, no, that was just a red herring. It wasn't her. It could have been anyone in that town that killed Jim Bohatz. But then you have drylanders who to this day swear that Helen did it. So it's just interesting. Yeah, it definitely is. So basically, he was murdered in this community's equivalent of a lover's lane. And he had invited Helen on a car ride under the pretense of of working out their differences, right? Yes. He was trying to, I think he was trying to impress her with his fancy car. And, uh... I'm in the camp that says, no, she didn't do it because there were too many other people that could have. And he took her to what was described in all the newspaper accounts as a trysting spot and claimed that the car had run out of gas or the engine would not start. But I had spoken with some people that claimed that she came back from that place on foot. And because she had been wearing a white dress, it was all muddy. And so there were people that were still alive uh, 10 years ago in DeWitt that claimed to have seen her because she came to their aunt's house asking for help. But that doesn't mean she killed anyone. It just means she ran away through the woods in a white dress that got muddy. He was killed with his own gun, wasn't he? Correct. And the idea is that she basically took it out of the glove box and shot him when he was getting handsy with her, right? Supposedly that was her later confession. But at the time that Jim Bohatz was killed, she plainly stated that she did not do it and the investigation cleared her. So that's why I say Jim Bohatz's death comes back to haunt us later because she was never formally charged with his death. There were just too many question marks and it was basically circumstantial evidence and they couldn't build a case. So what prompts her, do you think, to to suddenly turn herself in, to, to confess to murder? I mean, she's not under suspicion for killing Jim Bohatz. What do you think motivated her to admit to the crime? This is the crux of the book that literally forced me to do whatever I had to do to raise the $20,000 and work for the past four years to make a film because it took me years to get my publisher to let me add a new paragraph to clarify what we learned when the book was published and I began going out into the community and meeting people from the area around the pea farm that is north of the Arkansas river. So it is quite a long way from the Delta. 
And the area of the women's prison, the pea farm, was a rural, typical working farm with basically slave labor, house squad, inmates. And it never had enough funding. And it was created by an act of the legislature in about 1920. And there were never more than a few dozen women there. And it was just a a hellhole. And she managed to make it through the the initial manslaughter sentence. She she did her time and then she was paroled. And in the book, I was going off of the Gazette because as an Arkansas journalist, the Gazette was always the gold standard. And in the Gazette, it was very specific. It said when Helen was paroled, she moved to Little Rock and began working at Casanelli's restaurant under an assumed name. But then less than a week later, she went back to the police station in Little Rock and turned herself in and confessed to the murder of Jim Bohatz and was sent back to prison. Now, why would she do that if she was free and clear of all suspicion? We only found out for sure after the book came out and all these people from that area came to us and explained that the women from the women's prison were basically sexually trafficked for money. You could rent a woman, you could check her out like a book for however much money you would pay. And a wealthy plantation owner uh, purchased Helen Spence. We have the, the parole bond that he signed. But when I was writing the book, I didn't understand what these documents meant because I've never been to prison. I've never been paroled. And there was an employment agreement. Uh, His plantation was in the adjacent county in Scott, Arkansas. He was a wealthy man. He was the head of the, uh, he was the school superintendent for Lone Oak County. I did find some uh, documents online from uh, court documents from the 1930s. So this man paid the equivalent today of $30,000. And Helen Spence was on his plantation, subjected to God knows what. And then she ran away and she went where she thought she could find help, which was the Little Rock detective, James Pitcock, who turned out to be a grandstanding misogynistic power broker and railroaded her into a confession. That's that's the consensus among river people. Now that we've made the film, we've done all the interviews, we've analyzed the documentation that was the basis for the book, and we've included these documents in our film. Yeah, that's so horrific that a system like that was in place. Uh, the pea farm was, was a really terrible place to be incarcerated, and there are a lot of villains in your book. And one of the worst was a guard, a man named Frank Martin. Oh, Lord. He was the trusty guard, but he himself had been convicted of murdering, shooting and murdering an unarmed man. So he was the, you know, whatever he was, he had full full reign at that prison. And Mr. and Mrs. Brockman were also very dark characters And that whole entire area, as we were able to investigate with the film, has the most supernatural activity of any place I've ever been in Arkansas, which there are a lot of spooky places in Arkansas. I've stayed in the Crescent Hotel, and I would live in the Crescent Hotel rather than spend five minutes on the pea farm area after dark because it is that creepy. And we've heard countless stories. We've had people, uh, especially women and especially children, which seem to be sensitive to this, see Miss Brockman as a terrifying old woman stalking that area. And that's one of the reasons that I really want my film to reach an audience, because I have been requested by my readers to keep going and make a sequel that focuses on the mystery of the pea farm where it was torn down and raised to the ground 
after Frank Martin, the trusty guard, took the rap for killing Helen, Helen Spence during her, it was either her third or fifth escape. We have documents for three of the escapes, but there was some torture involved. There was a lot of torture involved. She was held in a, she was held in a cage. She was subjected to medical tortures. We have the handwritten medical documents. Uh, that was something that was one of the worst things that I wrote about in the book. And we don't really touch on it in the film because I really did not want to make a prison film. I did not want to exploit Helen Spence because of her, you know, status as a marginalized culture, a river person. I did not want to exploit her any further. There are definitely people who still do want to exploit her though. But in telling this story, it's important for people to hear how she overcame these obstacles. And it's all that more powerful when we understand how truly dire her situation was. So um, I, I think the first time she escapes, she just walks right out, right, from a work detail. There really isn't much by way of, of, of fencing or walls. The property is literally 200 acres. Um, after she was murdered and it was torn down, it was subdivided into a kind of a large neighborhood that was never finished. And that in itself is unusual. All the streets are named for women prisoners and Helen street is a dead end. Yeah. But you're right about the hopeful aspect because here's the thing about river people. When someone dies, a river person, and you'll notice this in the film more than in the book because there were several examples of it. When someone dies, a river person does not talk in the past tense about that person because they still talk to them. My river granny always talked to Grandpa Joe, and he died before I was even born. But she still talked to him. And, uh, you know, they're very pragmatic. One of the sayings on the river is the river gets its revenge. The river will eat you up in the end. And another saying of river people, which kind of shows their culture and their spirituality, is God don't want me and hell's already full. Yeah. So I don't know if you ever heard that, but that's one I've heard m many, many times. So she, Helen Spence had a superpower that is characteristic of almost every river person I've met, which is she laughed in the face of doom. The only other thing she did besides say, well, Jack Worlds killed my daddy uh, when the reporters were trying to ask her if she was worried about going to the electric chair, she laughed in their faces. And she never let anybody make her cow down. She was always using her own talents to escape. And that's where her escape dress comes in. Because she was such a wonderful seamstress, she saved the red-checked gingham napkins from the prison laundry and sewed them into the lining of her prison dress. And on one of the occasions during the depth of the depression, they would take these women up to Memphis where the brothels were and make them earn money for the prison. So they were taking the girls up to Memphis and they stopped off at the bus station before they went over the bridge to Memphis. They were in West Memphis and she asked to use the restroom and she went in and turned her red gingham napkin dress inside out and just walked away because she looked like a fashion model. So everything she did was based on survival and fearlessness and courage from her culture. And in the midst of all of this, she managed to maintain her optimism to an extent. And she befriended a woman named Catherine while at the pea farm. Yes. And sometimes I wonder if it was Catherine that wrote the letter that I include. I include an excerpt from a letter that was printed on the front page of the Gazette after Helen Spence was, was murdered, shot trying to escape. And 
I think Catherine wrote that letter. It just sounds like it describes their relationship. They were basically as close as sisters in the barracks of the women's prison. She signed the letter Mrs. Butterworth. And that's what makes me think it was a a nom de plume. But in the letter, she says that in all the time she knew Helen, Helen never cussed. She never cursed. She never said a curse word. She would always sing old time river songs and she didn't gossip about the other girls. All of that is exactly the difference between river culture and drylander culture. They don't mince words. If they say something, they, they do what they say they're going to do. They don't give you double talk and they don't say more than they need to say. She would entertain the other inmates, right, with stories about her childhood, the area she grew up in, the White River. Yes, and how wonderful that one of the best things to come out of my writing this book was that I was told these wonderful stories about this band of brothers in Arkansas County called the Jenkins Brothers or the Jenkins Boys. and. After the book came out, I ended up meeting the descendants and the family of the Jenkins brothers. And uh, one of the stories, now LC told me this story, but it was one that Helen told as well, was that the Jenkins boys, they would go to the Drylander church and the families would come up and park in the shade. And then if the babies inside the church building, if they started fussing during the sermon, then the mothers would take the babies out and and tend to them and then swaddle them up and put them in the buckboard to sleep till the end of the church service. So the Jenkins boys went and switched all the drylander babies around. And when everybody got home for Sunday dinner, they had to turn around to take all the babies back. Nobody had the right baby. This actually happened more than once (laughs) until the drylanders took to check in their babies before they left for home. So that was a good one. And then the the next one he told that I put in the book for Helen to share with the with the girls at the pea farm was the drylander church in the book. I changed it to a, a brush arbor. I think I'm not sure it might be in my second book. I've got a second book that I. I really go hard into the Jenkins boys (laughs) because I love them so much. But anyway, they would come to the church and during preacher Burton's sermon, they start stomping their big work boots on the floor and he didn't say anything about it. But the next time he came to preach, he puts his Bible on the pulpit and then he takes his big gold pocket watch out and sets that down on top of the Bible. And then he takes out his big, black Schofield pistol and puts that on the pulpit and says, I come here to preach the word of the Lord, but if anybody in back want to make noise, I'll be happy to send them to hell. (laughs) (laughs) So, yeah, as you've said, Helen endures all sorts of terrible torture in this place. She's, She's lashed with a whip, which is one of her punishments. At one point, she's given these weird medical treatments, and, and they lead to her getting a kidney infection. And she's put into a cage as well. Yes, and this was during, you know, they called it the Dirty 30s. So in 1933, 34, it was such a heat wave and such a drought. And so for them to put her in a cage in the full heat of the sun uh, and no escape from it was the the temperature would rise well over 100 degrees. The medical professional that was assigned to the pea farm literally took her out of this cage and carried her to the big house and chastised uh, the warden and her husband for allowing her to be tortured like this and said, you can put a ball and chain on her, but don't put her back in that box. And then there was a, a, a time when they had tortured her and and she was still not knuckling under to them in any way. And 
they w- they could not break her spirit, so they shipped her off to basically the state mental asylum. It was called the State Hospital for Nervous Diseases. And that's where you really get a sense of the time period because she was being experimented on and tortured in this. Well, not so much experimented on, but just tortured with medical tortures that evoke what the Nazis were doing in Germany in the 30s because of people that they considered to be inferiors. They would kill disabled children in institutions. So when Helen went to the Arkansas, you know, insane asylum, she was diagnosed as not insane. However, she was given a diagnosis that was the exact same diagnosis that the Nazis used as the basis for their inferiors campaign. It was called constitutional psychopathic inferiority. So do you think she was purposely killed by prison officials? Yes, Eric, I I do think that the timeline, uh, based on the prison documents that I was given from Arkansas Department of Corrections, the timeline shows that she had escaped. There was a missing punishment report, so there were no details on what happened. But the river people were, were told in communications that were smuggled out of the prison that Helen was beaten and was dying. And then the prison itself contacted uh, the lawyer for Helen's remaining family, which was a distant uncle who lived on a houseboat, Uncle Pless Spence. And the prison itself said that Helen was in, she might die. She was given enemas and she was given douches and it just boggles the mind. She was sent from the prison hospital to a small town hospital, the opposite direction from Little Rock, which is also very suspicious because it was a small town hospital and she was sent there and she immediately began to recover. So whatever they were trying to cure her with at the prison was making her worse. She at one point had a 104, 105 temperature. Uh, After all of this, when she was released from the hospital in BB, Arkansas, which was a very small town hospital, she came back and had to be on digitalis because her heart was weakened uh, by all of this torture. So she was never the same, but they did not break her spirit. They may have broken her tiny, tiny body. We're talking about a girl that is 5'1", and 125 pounds, size five shoe. So she was tiny. She wrote a lot while she was incarcerated, right? She did write a memoir. It was called Relative to Iniquity. While she was at the state hospital mental asylum, unfortunately, being such a young, innocent girl, she did give the return address of the pea farm. The story was rejected and sent back to the pea farm. And that is when she became a marked woman because we do have through uh, the grand jury testimony that we were able to find one page of this memoir. She was a wonderful writer. She was a poet. She obviously had a lot of intelligence and they decided that she was dangerous. They could not let her tell her story because then the world would know that they were trafficking young women and torturing and killing young women. And she was not the only one to be spread eagled over a pickle barrel and flogged naked. There was another prisoner named Winona Green who had been done the same way, that we do have written evidence about. Now, the ones that we don't have written evidence about, what do you think? 
Yeah, I definitely get your point. So you believe her final escape attempt was a setup? Yes, her final escape attempt was believed to be a setup because it was rumored that she was allowed to escape. There was a man on the pea farm property that day that was fixing a water pump. And he, he gave testimony that we were able to access in our research that stated they just, Frank Martin and the Brockmans just watched her leave. And then they took off after her later. She managed to elude them by walking all night through the woods, nine miles, and she made it onto Carmichael Road. She just must have figured that she did not have anything left to lose, and she had to leave. She had been on the host squad again, and she just left. And she was still on this medication. So the fact that she even made it nine miles through this heavily, heavily wooded area is amazing. And there were some accounts that a little boy saw her asleep on the ground under an oak tree and ran to tell, but we never could track that down. I did find the niece and the nephew of the last two families who met Helen Spence on the road. She came to one farm and asked for a ride and the woman jumped off the porch and ran out into the field where her husband was plowing because she was so afraid she knew it was a, an escaped prisoner. And when they got back, Helen was gone. Then we interviewed for the film this wonderful 90, she, she's probably 99 by now. When we interviewed her, she was 96, I believe. Lady named Nell Garvin, whose aunt was out in the yard uh, visiting with her aunt, and they had hung wash on the line and there's a beautiful well that's still there to this day. And Helen came walking up the road and asked them for a drink of water. They gave her water from the well and then watched as she went on down the road. And then here come the truck. And they said there was two men in there. Helen was shot behind the ear, like an execution style shot in the road in front of the two women, Vera and May Bearden. And oddly enough, I went to high school with their great niece or great, great niece. Um, it's just all connected. They took a sheet off the line and they covered Helen Spence's body. But at some point, reporters showed up and someone ripped open her shirt and shoved a pistol into her bra and took a photograph that was given to me and like a trophy. So you do believe that prison authorities were worried about her memoir, worried that she would expose them, and that's the reason why she was killed? I fully believe that after they read Helen Spence's memoir and saw that she was able to communicate in a meaningful way that she would make a very convincing witness against the illegal activities at the pea farm. And it was after Helen was shot and killed that Jack, I mean, excuse me, Frank Martin, the trusty guard took the rap for her murder and was paroled. So there's still a big question mark because a lot of people think it was not, that they think that it was one of the Brockmans that did it, and Frank Martin just took the rap, and then the deal was that he would be paroled. And then he went on to live a life as a mean person who beat his wife and was mean to his children and was a terrible, abusive, alcoholic person. And then one day Frank Martin was walking down uh, in Casco to the supermarket and he wanted a loaf of bread and the lady behind the counter at the market was from the river but Frank Martin didn't know that 
And he always bragged about being the man who shot and killed the notorious Helen Spence. So the lady offered to sell him a different loaf of bread that was cheaper but tasted just as good. And Frank Martin went home that night and had dinner and he never woke up the next morning. And the river people always said the river got him. But at this point, Helen was gone and everyone was instantly sympathetic to her again. There were offers of plots and people said she can be buried in my family plot. And people sent flowers, tons of flowers, sent beautiful silk dresses for her to be buried in. So after she was murdered, at least the river people were very sympathetic. There was some kind of note left in the cage, right? Yes, supposedly there was a note left behind in Helen's special cage that said, to whom it may concern, I will never be taken alive. And here's where the written word, and especially cursive writing, shows its importance because Helen was a very prolific writer and she wrote tons and tons of letters as well. And it was side by side with that note, an example of Helen Spence's handwriting, and it was obviously a forgery. And that's when the grand jury said the whole pea farm is going to be scrutinized. And that's when the Brockmans lost their jobs. It's when Frank Martin almost got convicted. It was overturned on a technicality. That was when the superintendent of the prison system, the entire prison system, was forced to resign. It's because of the cover-up. Her body would then be put on public display, right? Yes, her body was, we found, I found, um, and, and my readers were very good about following up on this. The readers on the north side of the Arkansas River, uh, one of my dear friends uh, found the actual death certificate, the form at the funeral home, which is still there in North Little Rock. And that's actually when we learned what her true birth date was from that death certificate that my reader found when he went to the place where Helen was first brought after she was killed. And supposedly, according to the newspaper accounts in North Little Rock, she was visited by throngs of people came to see her body in North Little Rock. When she was taken down to Arkansas County, her body was once again put on display, but the river people were not having it. And that's when a group of them, according to John Black, who basically guarded and tended Helen's unmarked grave until he died 50, 40 or 50 years ago, John Black and the river people came and spirited her body away and took her to the potter's field of the St. Charles Cemetery and buried her next to where Cicero was buried. After my book came out, the Arkansas County Funeral Home put Cicero's marker up. It had been in storage since 1930 when he was killed. Is Helen Spence still remembered in Arkansas? Is this a, a well-known story today? I would say that Helen Spence is not in the forefront in Arkansas so much. She's more well-known thanks to podcasters like you. She's more well-known uh, in Canada and Japan and Denmark because we've had so many audiobook sales in those countries. Her story is a commentary, but it's timeless because of the tragedy and the reasons for the tragedy. They all stem from, you know, on the one hand, family loyalty and a culture that has been systematically, is still being systematically destroyed by its own government. What I meant was that there are elements still in, for example, I learned of a state archives, which is the state historical entity. It's called the state archives. 
were having a seminar and one of the topics was going to be Helen Spence. And I asked to be included so that I could bring my research to a wider audience. These were educators getting credit. Uh, I go there and the state archives staffer who had told me that he Googled Helen Spence for a few months and that's how he learned about her. And I said, well, when I was writing the book, you could not Google her. So it's because of search engine optimization, because of all the stuff I've written that you're able to Google her now. He stood up in front of a room full of educators and claimed that Helen Spence was basically a whore, that she was pregnant from sleeping around in the prison. Now, who would she sleep with? There was one guard. There was an older man who was the warden's husband. There was their son, who was a big question mark. Who, who impregnated Helen Spence while she was in a women's prison? There were five medical professionals, including the state medical examiner, present at Helen Spence's autopsy that claimed she was not pregnant at all. So that's another way that the state tried to not just kill her, but to kill her name, her good name. The same way that they said she confessed to a murder that she was not confessing to a murder. She was agreeing to anything rather than be sexually trafficked to a wealthy plantation owner in Scott, Arkansas. Right, right. So how can people connect with you? You, you do have a website. Yes, I actually don't have a website anymore because the person that I paid to create the website was not a river person and he stole the money and left, <laughs> left town. <laughs> but anyway, that was a, a learning experience. Everyone who wants to reach out to me can come to me through Facebook, which is Denise Parkinson. Daughter of the White River is my Facebook page where I update about our continued efforts to bring this story to its intended audience because Spoiler alert and surprise, surprise, my book has never been reviewed in my home state. It was reviewed outside my home state and called a work of regional significance. It was my book, Daughter of the White River, was chosen to represent Arkansas for the year of the book. It was at the uh, National Archives back when it came out a decade ago. My book was also chosen for the updated Arkansas Reader's Map. So those are two examples of why my book should be reviewed. But yet, alas, I thought, I'll make a movie. Surely that will reach a wider audience. Well, for the past year, we have been sending, we have been paying <laughs> to send our movie to various film festivals in and around Arkansas, and it has been rejected. So as true river people, we are forging ahead and renting out theaters and showing the film to enthusiastic audiences that absolutely love it. Our next screening is scheduled for next month at the Stuttgart Twin Cinema. And I am in the process of raising the funds to rent that out. I'm almost there, but until I rent that out, we're shooting for a, a specific date, but all I can say right now is it's going to be a Sunday matinee midway through November as soon as I can get the rent. <laughs> and this is the only theater left in Arkansas County because my culture is still being robbed. We're being robbed of economic opportunity while at the same time, the Delta feeds the world. We're being robbed of our bridges and our infrastructure when at the same time, the Delta is the perfect place for heritage tourism. So all of these reasons make it a, a very timely moment for Helen Spence to be the Arkansas folk hero that we need today. 
a, a legendary badass that refuses to cow down. In fact, when I see what's happening in Iran with the young, very young women being brutalized, I think of Helen Spence and I pray for those women. But, but people can find out more about you at dwparkinson.com, right? Oh, I do see where you pulled up my website. Um, that's more of just an informational website. So it's not a website where I can say, sell you a book or sell you a photo um, or sell you a copy of the documentary through my website, but definitely uh, dwparkinson.com is my website. It's been up since my book came out. We attempted to have a website called daughteroftheWhiteRiver.com, but we learned the hard way not to do business with drylanders. <laughs> well, well, thank you again for sharing Helen Spence's story today. Thank you so much, Eric, for speaking with me and caring about our Arkansas folk hero. We do believe she is the inspiration for Maddie Ross. So thank you so much. I, Eric, I would like to say, I was hoping to end it on like a, a, a high note because it's such a, it's such a, an affecting story. There are so many dark periods in Helen Spence's life. I do think it's important that the river people never stopped caring for her. John Black tended her grave in secret for decades. And then he passed down the information and the location of her grave to Mr. Brown. And when I found Mr. Brown and asked him about river culture because of my ancestry, even though Mr. Brown considered me a northerner because we were up in Clarendon, which is north of St. Charles, that was one of his jokes. He passed it all down to me and he said, we have to clear Helen Spence's name. And he got people to come from his army unit and bring radar detecting, ground penetrating radar. And there is a body planted at the cedar tree that John Black planted at the head of Helen Spence's grave. The cedar tree is still there. Our team, including my executive producer, Dorothy Morris, who is 2022's Arkansas Woman of the Year inductee, she funded a marker and we set up the footstone at Helen Spence's grave and her cedar tree is still there and people visit and plant flowers and leave mussel shells and pray at Helen Spence's grave. And the cedar tree is miraculously still there because just in the past three years, there have been numerous straight line windstorms. And one they think was like a, an F1 tornado that have decimated that historic cemetery, but her tree is always untouched. And there are tons of trees that have fallen down and broken headstones. I mean, this is the Delta. So the tornadoes can come through there because it's flat, but her grave is so close to the white river. I mean, you can just walk to the edge of the white river from her grave. Yeah. It, it sounds beautiful. Well, well, I so appreciate your time. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. You you are what we call here building your mansion in heaven. And I'm going to adopt that, you nice. as a river rat, an honorary river rat. <laughs> Again, I have been speaking to Denise White Parkinson. She is the author of Daughter of the White River, Depression-Era Treachery and Vengeance in the Arkansas Delta. This has been another episode of the Most Notorious Podcast, broadcasting to every dark and cobwebbed corner of the world. I'm Eric Rivenis, and have a safe tomorrow.